Hi, I'm Gary and this is episode 172 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at renewable tech. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to thank Rob Pryor, who donates regularly to the EV Musings coffee.com account, ko-fi.com. It's an alternate way to support my work, and I thank you very much for doing so, Rob. Our main topic of discussion today is the sort of tech that exists in the renewable space. Now, this is a big area for discussion, so I'm going to have to try and narrow it down. Regular listeners will know that I've gone all in on the renewable tech for the house, electric vehicles, solar panels, zappy chargers, storage battery, heat pump, etc. And that's the sort of tech that anyone, pretty much anyone could get for their house if they have the funds to be able to buy it, of course. But there's a whole suite of renewable tech that's pitched at a slightly different level to that. And this is what could be called grid scale tech. It's one of the key factors that make things like net zero and 100% renewables work seamlessly. Now, Robert Llewellyn from Fully Charged is famous for saying buying an EV is a gateway drug to other sorts of renewables and associated tech. When running an ICE car, nobody stopped to think about where their fuel came from. But once you get into EVs, you start to think about, well, where's my electricity coming from? How green is it? Can I generate my own? And that's where things like solar panels come into it. But it's also a whole host of related pieces of technology, such as time of day tariffs, feeding tariffs, partial ownership of wind farms, etc. Now, if you've listened to many episodes of this podcast, you'll know that I'm a big fan of Octopus Energy. They provide my electricity. They let me have cheap overnight charging. They have variable tariffs that benefit people with heat pumps and solar panels. And they're looking at democratizing the installation of heat pumps and a myriad of other things. But in over 160 episodes of this show, we've never had anyone from Octopus on the program. Now, Octopus is a large company with tentacles all over the place. Did you see what I did there? And there's no one person who could provide a good overview of all the many segments other than perhaps CEO Greg Jackson. But he's a really, really busy man. And an overview is not what I'm really looking for. So I've gone a little bit more specific. And I wanted to focus today on the renewables tech itself. To discuss renewables tech in more detail, I'm delighted to be joined today by Claire Miller. Claire is or was the head of, uh, well, you know what, I'll I'll let her explain. Welcome, Claire. Hi, nice to be here. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about who you are, why they might have heard your name and what you do or did, please? So I'm Claire Miller. I was the Director of Tech and Innovation at Octopus Electric Vehicles uh, for four years. And uh, whilst I still have a association with Octopus, uh, I'm now kind of out there in the wild helping startups and scale-ups and big organisations across the mobility and energy ecosystem. So everything from, I don't know, big companies that need to think about how they turn their whole fleet electric to uh, the national grid and what that needs to look like in the future, novel technologies in batteries and charging and new vehicles, all sorts. So yeah, hopefully as we chat, we'll, we'll, we can touch on a few of those things. But yeah, so I spent four years at Octopus uh, full-time. I got involved at the start of 2019 when Fiona Howarth, the CEO of Octopus Electric Vehicles, gave me a call and said, we've got this project. We're thinking about how we get vehicle to grid working and we've one part of a funding pot from Innovate UK, so part of what was then Bayes funding, along with other projects that were funded, and we need some help. And when I sort of heard that, that's sort of really grist to my mill. It's all new tech, new hardware, new software, new app, new business, new everything. So so that was how I kind of got involved with Octopus. And uh, we can, I'm sure, delve into a bit of that project. That was Power Loop, Vehicle to Grid. And then through 2019, we started talking about what should Octopus Electric Vehicles be? Because at that point, it was pretty nascent. It was, I don't know, a handful of people thinking about what our EV is going to be in the world and what should Octopus be doing in that space. And we could see that salary sacrifice was going to have a renaissance because the UK government was going to make the benefit in kind tax rate 0% from April 2020. So 
we had this idea to launch a product to, to enter that EV salary sacrifice space. But actually, we realized into 2020 that what we really needed to do was to launch a leasing company and, and to build that and get that out there. So just as we went into lockdown in 2020, we started building what we needed to be a leasing company. So I also architected and built all the original systems and sort of processes and how we were going to work as a business. So yeah, so if you call Octopus EV now, you get me because I set up the phones and I had to record myself to be the message and, and the welcome message and stuff like that. So there you go. There's a bit about me in the last few years. And then I guess my origin story is uh, is mechanical engineering. So I did mechanical engineering at university and I was in tech and R&D and innovation consulting when I left uni. And uh, and I did that at a consultancy first. And then I went and did that freelance for many years across lots of different sectors. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a pretty uh, healthy introduction there. We had um, Tom Swaffle Bray, who's a mechanical engineer on the, uh, on the podcast last year. And he's very much of the opinion that quite a lot of what happens today from a pollution and global warming point of view actually can be traced back to mechanical engineers in some way, shape or form. Not that they've done it maliciously, but a lot of what's actually created is a result of the kind of work that they've been done, which was an interesting discussion. I don't expect you to comment on that. But what I do want to come back to is Director of Tech and Innovation. It's it's a title that conjures up either images of you know gurus sitting in labs experimenting and making things, or it's like an episode of Scrap Heap Challenge or junkyard wars for our American listeners, with bits of cast off machines being cannibalized to make prototypes, which is closer to the truth. <laughs> That's such <laughs> such an interesting, uh, yeah, an interesting observation. Um, so actually, Scrap Heap Challenge is super close to my heart. It was like required viewing when I was younger. And uh, I literally just introduced my two children to it the other day. It kicked off uh, several days of building rockets and trebuchets and submarines and hovercrafts, or at least trying to out of bits of junk and, you know, recycling stuff out of recycling bin. So yeah, it's, Scrap Heap Challenge is a really important one for me. I've always been a tinkerer and like to fix things and take things apart. And I'm still in trouble with my mum for taking apart uh, the telephone when I was about seven, just trying to work out kind of how it worked. But in those days, you know, it was a phone attached to the wall and it didn't go back quite as well. Maybe it wasn't designed for a pair, let's put it that way. So um, I think I personally am probably more scrap heap challenge. And in terms of my role as director of tech and innovation, I the way I explain it is the, the, the tech piece uh, was really about how do you run a leasing business? What should that look like? You know, what happens on the customer journey from customer lands on the website? Okay, so what does the website look like? How does a customer learn and maybe build their quote for a vehicle? Okay, what does that feel like? What are, what does all that data need to be? Kind of, yeah, piecing it all together all the way through to, you know, in life, how do you help these folk if they need help, questions, education, you know, what do you need there? So for example, like the phone line, how do you have partners? How do you build all of that world? So that's the tech piece, which is for me quite, you know, although it's digital in this instance, it for me, in, in my mind, I can almost feel it as a physical thing. I map it out in my mind. How do we need to build these systems together? You know, integrating third parties, are we going to build something ourselves? And then on the innovation side, that was really thinking about that whole vehicle to grid concept of, you know, I guess similarly, you know, how do you work with different systems, some that don't exist yet, some that are really early. So the wall box quasar, Chadamo bidirectional charger, for example, you know, we started talking to wall box in probably about about this time, 2019. And in those days, again, handful of folk in a warehouse in Barcelona, trying to put this new charger together it was quite prototype trying to build the our system on top of something that was quite prototype was a big challenge and that for me is the innovation piece around well how do you make this work where you have new hardware new software needed new concepts around flexibility you know how do you then also give a customer an experience where they can always get their vehicle when they need it because it's it's a car but how do you maximize the battery potential there for the customer to have value and for it to support the grid. So yeah, I don't know, definitely more scrap heap challenge, I think is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, vehicle to grid at the moment is for the most part restricted to, as you mentioned, Chadabo capable cars. And that's one of the reasons that 
Dr. Ewan McTurk on this very podcast said that Chadamo is the better standard for vehicle charging. But CCS seems to have won that particular va- uh, battle. Where do you see vehicle to grid going over the medium to long term? Are we going to go CCS? Are we going to stick with Chadamo? Can we make an AC version? Does it really matter? Um, all good questions. I would never presume to disagree with Ewan McTurk, Dr. Ewan McTurk. And uh, Ewan and I have had some fun chats about this along the way. Uh, he, he said that doing vehicle to grid with a with a vehicle battery was uh, was like the battery was having a nice warm foot soak and a shoulder rub. When I asked him about his view about battery degradation and vehicle to grid and, and how did batteries feel about it. So I think we were anthropomorphizing batteries quite a lot that day. So look, I agree with him in terms of Chadamo. It, it's a very solid um, system. It works very reliably. It was designed for this purpose. Um, I'm, it sounds like you've really delved into Chadamo and some of the background to it. So, But we need to be a bit brutal and understand that sometimes, you know, new standards come along for different reasons and that it's a really cliched one, but v- VHS beta max, right? So CCS is the standard that has won out mostly globally. And now the, now the kind of work is being done to make that work for lots of different use cases, right? So plug and charge, thinking about, you know, how do you get that Tesla-esque experience in a standardized way? How do you make the vehicle, you know, be able to communicate with the charge point without having to have any kind of other interaction? Like that's one of the kind of foundational pieces for CCS, which will build up to eventually the whole kind of system being able to do vehicle to grid and other actors in the system being able to interact with the vehicles. I mean, that's a that's a utopian view of a fully digitized energy grid. Whether we'll get there or not, we'll we'll have to live it and we'll have to be involved in it as engineers and technologists and uh, see how much of that ecosystem grows out. But yeah, I think, you know, CCS is there. And then your question was about, you know, sort of the medium term, what we're going to see. Well, what we're going to see is vehicle manufacturers bringing CCS V2G enabled vehicles. And actually, Lots of vehicles right now, you could argue, are enabled or can be enabled by software upgrades over the air. So actually, I don't think it's a question of is V2G ever going to happen? And I also, for anyone listening who is thinking or maybe shouting at (laughs) me at the moment saying, we've been waiting for this forever. You know, this has been around forever. It's been coming soon forever. I do. I do hear you. And and I'm sort of in that camp myself, actually, because now we're in the hands of the vehicle manufacturers. But actually, there are vehicles on the road now that will be software upgradable and lots of companies are talking about it, right? Lots of the vehicle manufacturers are, are talking about bringing V2G and they want to do that. So I think that the challenges now or, the, or the, the blockers that remain are for them to get those vehicles to market. And some of that is tied up with, you know, vehicle supply generally, which is a challenge at the moment. And part of that is around like the software challenge of working with a new standard. And I think I'm going to delve into the standards. I know that you do like a standard, Gary. I, I enjoyed your um, your episode with Neil uh, from Power. You, you've delved into some good some good standards there. So yeah, so ISO fifteen one one eight arguably will be the standard, but it's been coming for a very long time, and so vehicle manufacturers have been doing their own proprietary interpretation of ISO fifteen one one eight, and so you know, sadly, the standard is still not the standard, but it's closer to a standard than we had before. So Vehicles are coming. Standard is there. There's some work to do. Uh, and then in the middle of all this is the charger. And so that the other thing I think it's worthwhile touching on is that some vehicle manufacturers will choose to do the AC to DC and DC back to AC step on the vehicle. Others will choose to do that in the charger, sort of off board of the vehicle. And so there's there's a bit of a bifurcation, dare I use that word? Some customers will choose a vehicle which will require a charger that has an inverter in it, right? So it will be able to do the the alternating current from the grid to the DC direct current that the battery wants to kind of consume. They will have to have a charger that does that on the side of their house, which is the same as the Chadamo concept, not the same tech, but the same concept. Others will only, inverted commas, need an AC charger that has 
slightly different power electronics to their home charger today, which would allow the AC to move in both directions. So that's something to keep in mind and how we navigate that with customers to explain that if you go with this vehicle, it will need this charger versus the other options. That's something I think we need to start thinking about how we as an industry navigate that with customers because chargers aren't cheap, right? Well, exactly. And I was going to talk about that because did, did you say the Chatamo V2G that's used in, in Powerloop, the, the units there are, is it Quasar? Is that the company that, uh, that does those? Yeah. In the UK, there are two companies that have like Chatabo enabled chargers. They are not widely commercially available. Um, the two companies are Wallbox and their Chadamo charger is called a Quasar. In fact, they now call it Quasar 1 because they're going to bring a, a CCS-enabled version, a Quasar 2. Then there's Indra. So shout out to Mike Schooling and the Indra gang who also have a Chadamo charger and were involved in another project at the same time as we were doing Powerloop, putting those chargers out out there on a, on a trial. And they're about to start another trial, actually, looking at vehicle to home sort of specifically about self-consumption. So yeah, so those are the two at the moment. And again, I, I often get asked, well, I've got a Nissan Leaf. I'd love to get a charger. I'd love to be able to do this. How do I do it? And I think part of the challenge is that because that Chadamo standard hasn't been globally adopted, there isn't a path to sort of scale for these Chadamo chargers. So I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, never say never, because I don't know what the strategy is for either of those companies in terms of like maybe bringing small quantities of, of Chadamo chargers in the future. But yeah, for what we proved out on Powerloop, that's what we needed because we wanted to use the Nissan Leaf because the Nissan Leaf is the only passenger vehicle um, that has Chadamo and V2G enabled. And that allowed us to do the trial and actually to build the service and to prove that, yes, you can do this in someone's home. And here are all the steps that you need to do in order to make that happen. So given that there are two options, which is actually have the, the inverter part on the vehicle versus having the inverter part on the charger, which would be your preference? I don't I don't think I can really say it's such a complicated decision for the manufacturers. And you know, I, I would rather have them sell it to me. Um, that's a very fence dwelling answer, isn't it? But like, I would like to to understand how the different manufacturers see the benefit of building it into the vehicle versus taking it off board the vehicle and how they play that back. I think from a pure engineering perspective and cost perspective, it's a component which costs money, is expensive, probably will have a silicon carbide inverter element. Who knows? Maybe the future is gallium nitride. I mean, that's a whole other tech question about, you know, what what those sort of power electronics components should be and materials and there's a whole world there. So so there's probably a lot of that that's going into their decision around do they want to add this to the vehicle or do they want to have it off board? I think just being, you know, from myself as a as an individual now, sort of representing no no one but myself and my family, having a simpler charger makes it simpler for me at home because, you know, it's probably going to be a bit cheaper. But then maybe if vehicles without the system on board, if if that becomes a prevailing standard in the future, you know, then a then a, an inverter in your charger will be mass market product and therefore the economies of scale will kick in and they'll be cheaper so yeah it's quite a difficult one isn't it it's quite a it's quite a thorny one it is because obviously yeah i mean you mentioned economies of scale there because the indra and the warbox uh tech whilst it's excellent um technology on there it's i believe it's quite a bit more expensive at the moment than just a plain old uh, ac uh, charger that you'll fit on your wall but obviously if we can get to the situation where you're buying a charger and you're paying x amount for it or when it just happens to have ccs enabled vehicle to grid then there isn't going to be any additional pain for the uh the user who's having to buy that and have it installed because they have to buy a charger and have it installed anyway so if we can get the price down to a, a low enough value the pain's going to be minimal isn't it yeah for sure and i think you know there's also maybe we need to take a bit of a big step back and say those of us who've been involved even for you know a couple of years a few years in the industry we've seen so much growth and so much development and so much new tech come to the, come to the fore but for the wider world we are we're not even near the early majority of adoption of this technologies of EVs of chargers and more home tech 
So I think we need to let it play out and not necessarily be too concerned right now about the numbers of charges that are already out there, because those are, you know, those those are great solid pieces of hardware generally across like EV chargers, but they will need replacing over time. And we are say we're not at that kind of adoption curve point where there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of chargers being put in, you know. So I think now is the window for some of these what can I say, you know, battle of the tech, you know, battle of the solution, like it, it will needs to play out over the next couple of years. And that will then start to drive where the economies of scale are. And then and, and as these things kind of get deployed in volume. Moving on. Now, Octopus Energy is mentioned almost every episode on this podcast for one reason or another, generally always positively. And they've innovated in many, many things in the energy sphere. Now, I'm particularly interested in things like the time of day tariffs that Octopus offer. Now, the industry's famously had things like Economy 7 for many years, but other than that, it was fairly slim pickings. Now, Octopus has come on with a whole suite of variable tariffs focused on EV drivers, heat pump owners, people who've got specific charges that they can link in for the extended period of time. So Tesla, um, the the charges that they use. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the thinking behind that? Because Octopus are losing money on that, right? How can they sustain it? Oh, okay. Uh, big questions to break down there. So I guess, um, again, another another kind of take a big step back and, and kind of look at where Octopus has come from and what the, what the point of it is. So um, being able to do something positive and impactful in the world to decarbonize is, whilst also offering great experiences for customers is at the heart of everything that Octopus does. And there are now many different parts to Octopus all doing the same thing in different ways. So when we think about tariffs, we think about what the point of innovating in tariffs and what's the point of, of offering these different options and, and who pays for it and what does it all mean? Again, I think it, it's an interesting time for learning and for exploring what's going to be good for customers and good for the grid. And so, you know, the overarching direction of travel on our grid is to decarbonize for it to become highly decentralized renewables based grid so we're going from an old hub and spoke generate a lot of electricity by burning stuff and push it out and then use quite crude you know levers to turn off and on you know loads on the grid to try and balance it the future is highly decentralized, lots of renewables, wind, solar, and actually you know, storage becomes very important in that because you know, renewables are intermittent, you know, don't happen all the time. We can't make them happen all the time. And domestic, so thinking about how we use energy in our homes and how each of us as individuals you know, ha- can use and store and be involved in energy in the grid. So that's a big transition and that's happening now and all around us. And National Grid are uh, very active in thinking about how should the grid look and how do we need to develop it and grow it and change it for the future and how do they manage the the electricity that's moving across the grid and and make use of this sort of flexibility. So storing energy in places where there's lots of energy on the grid and then trying to get that energy exported onto the grid where maybe there isn't so much renewable generation, that's flexibility. Okay, so so this year I feel like is the year of flexibility. It's starting to come up in people's minds. It's starting to become, you know, part of the public consciousness. And lots of people I'm sure will have heard of and hopefully took part in turning down their energy use for hour slots. Lots of energy suppliers and flexibility suppliers are, are, have signed up for that and are taking part in that. And that's a way that customers can actually take part in flexibility because by avoiding using energy, it means that it helps the grid. We don't need to meet that demand if you avoid using energy. That's the start of, of customers being involved. So bringing it back to tariffs, the original question. So tariffs are the way that us as customers pay for our energy. And you can have a tariff in both directions. You can be buying energy and that's how much does my energy cost? I pay my energy company. But you can have an export tariff. So if you have a way of putting energy back on the grid from your home, you can also get paid for that. So that's quite an important concept. And you need a smart meter. A smart meter is measuring literally how much energy you're consuming, 
uh, and at how much energy is going in the other direction back on the grid. So that's also really important in order for these energy flows to be metered and therefore for you to get paid, so to get settled, which is one of the, like the term for you know getting paid for doing this. And bringing it all together, thinking about different times on the grid where the cost of energy is different is what sits behind these tariffs. And that is kind of how the market works for energy, right? That's what drives flexibility, price signals. So it's a, it's a trading market in energy. Price signals are available. Energy costs a lot at the moment because it's tea time. Between four and seven, you know, everyone comes home, the classic British kettle goes on, electric heating, electric cooking, lights, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so the cost of energy goes up because there's a there's a peak demand on the grid. And at the moment, we burn a lot of gas, and that's not great. So, so at that time of the day, your energy is more expensive, sitting behind your tariff. Equally, overnight, a really windy night, the grid has sometimes too much energy. It needs somewhere to put that energy. So, if there's somewhere that it can store it, and if you can provide that as a service, somewhere to store energy, that's great, and that energy is really cheap. So, to your question about tariffs, and you know, are is Octopus making money? I think that's the wrong question to ask, actually. I think it's right now, what are we doing to build services and solutions that are good for our customers, for them to have the cheapest tariffs that they can have access to, which obviously is super important at the moment as well with generally the price of energy being very high. And let's not delve into that because we'll be here for many more hours than one podcast. But you know, we want the customers to have the cheapest access to energy they can whilst also participating in flexibility because it also helps our grid go greener faster. And in the middle of that is, uh, is, is, is innovation. And we're innovating in how do you make the customer experience work and how do we make that as a business work, to your point about money, and how do we do that by actually participating in those flexibility markets. So there are a range of tariffs, as you said. There's, there's Agile, which still exists and still around, still going, although not not quite as uh, attractive maybe as it was before because of the energy crisis, which is follows the wholesale price of energy. And there's also a Export Agile, um, which follows the, the the export price. There's there's still Go, the original EV tariff. So Fiona, our CEO of Octopus EV, was kind of one of the originators of that tariff saying, look, we need to drive demand for EVs and how can we help people be excited about them and think about how how you know, they can charge them more cheaply at home. And we have a window overnight where energy is cheaper, you know, because there's often abundant energy on the grid and it needs somewhere to store it. Let's have a cheap window, which will get people thinking about charging at different times. So that's a real time of use tariff. So Go is cheaper for four hours overnight than it is during the day. And then that the evolution of Go is Intelligent Octopus. So Intelligent Octopus is the first flexibility linked tariff. And again, this sort of hopefully people listening up kind of building up this picture in their mind of the vehicle itself, the EV, when you charge it, it actually becomes somewhere to store energy. And so when the grid sends a, a pricing signal to say, hey, it's it's cheaper at the moment, that's what that really is saying is we need somewhere to store energy right now. And if you've got somewhere to put energy, this is a really great, you know, this, this would be, help us as be a service to us to the grid. So Intelligent Octopus actually sends signals directly to your car or to, to some chargers. And the team uh, are working super hard and diligently building out integrations directly to vehicles and to, to chargers and, and to other tech as well, which we can talk about like heat pumps and batteries. So that when those pricing signals come from the grid, Kraken Flex, which is the platform that, you know, the Octopus platform that sits in the middle or Kraken overall, can then send the signal directly to those vehicles at the moment to say, yeah, please charge now in this half hour slot to meet that need. So Intelligent Octopus gives you six hours guaranteed cheaper energy overnight. And at any time when a signal comes to your, your vehicle, if you're plugged in, super important, then your whole home tariff will be charged at the cheaper rate as well because sometimes it's very it's very sunny in the day for example <laughs> it doesn't look very sunny today for me at the moment but when it's super sunny you know an abundant uh, abundant solar or a very windy afternoon there are opportunities to charge during the day as well which can help the grid so the customer's getting the benefit of that through that cheap energy and um, that cheaper tariff any time that they can offer flexibility and then i guess the the evolution of that is going to be for vehicles vehicle to grid just like charging the vehicle gives somewhere to save this energy you can also export energy from the vehicle where it makes sense and is suitable for the driver and it helps the grid so 
there's an evolution of tariffs, which are now underpinned by flexibility. And Octopus is at the forefront of innovating in this space. I, I always say, you know, it's, it's important to think about Octopus as a tech company that's innovating in energy and in mobility, because that frames what Octopus is trying to do, I think, better than thinking of Octopus as, as a kind of old fashioned big energy company, because it's very much not that. Do you know, I had a whole list of questions here, and you've answered about six of them in that one response to that one question I answered there. So um, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, I want to come back to, <laughs> I I want to come back and talk about decarbonisation and heat pumps and things like that uh, in a, a little while. But I just want one final question on pricing. And you may not be able to answer this, and that's fine. You mentioned the SEG, the Supplier Export Guarantee, which is primarily for those who have uh, solar and want to sell it back to the the grid. The law states that if you've got above a certain number of customers, you have to offer an SEG tariff, and, and Octopus do. And in the big scheme of things, it's not a big tariff in itself, but if you compare it with a lot of others, it's actually quite generous. How has that been how's that been decided? How do how have you decided that it's, you know, I think I'm being paid 4.1 pence a kilowatt hour, whereas there are competitors of yours who pay as little as one pence a kilowatt hour. What determines that value? Do you know? So standard export guarantee, the SEG, uh, as we call it, it's important that customers who can export right now, who are lucky enough, fortunate enough to have the kit to be able to export, who are not on a feed-in tariff right for their solar. So there's a lot of acronyms in this space. So you've got FIT and SEG. So if you're on FIT, you're not also on SEG. So, you know, there, there's a we're sort of in early adopter land, I would say, still, in terms of, well, very much so in terms of like exporting from your house generally. That I'm not an expert in in the tariff design and the economics of tariff design, but you know energy is valuable to the grid, and it will have been determined that this is a, a, a fair price and a fair tariff offer for our customers because that is fundamentally at the core of everything that Octopus does. So kind of beyond that, I personally am not close enough to it to say. And I couldn't comment on other suppliers and what they choose to do in this space. The thing I would say is that SEG is kind of a baseline. So SEG is like the the minimum export, I guess. And so if you're on Octopus Go, are you on Octopus Go? Is that what you've got? You've got Go. Go, Okay. So you've got, yeah. So, So the combination at the moment is Octopus Go incoming and SEG outgoing. And that's because we know that customers who have batteries as well as EVs, for example, will be charging their batteries overnight in the cheap window and then will be exporting it at some point where they're not self-consuming, potentially. So arbitrage is the word that folks need to know if they're not into this yet. You know, the price of energy that you buy versus the price of energy you can sell. Again, it's a market. It's it's a it's a trading market. So, you know, if you've got the kit to store energy and export energy at different times, that's how you start to get involved in this kind of imbalance between import and export tariff. So that's where SEG comes in as a fair kind of baseline export tariff. But when we start to think about more nuanced, like flexibility based tariffs in the future, I think you mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned a few, I think you might have mentioned there's things like Cozy and Flex, as well as Intelligent Octopus. So the team in the flexibility part of Octopus are starting to think about what if you have a heat pump, uh, what if you have solar and a battery, as well as what if you have an EV. And so you're seeing like the innovation kind of live happening like before your eyes and and what they're thinking about and they're testing and trialing is what happens and how do customers feel and how do they how do they live with a tariff like this if they have this technology and so you'll see that then eventually start to converge with multiple devices and multiple experiences and layering it all on top of each other so segs are really an interesting part of that but it's very early days for export tariffs. And actually, it, it makes me think about, uh, or I reflect back on my time at a company called Alert Me. So 
about uh, oh, probably 12 years ago now, I was the director of delivery at a company called Alert Me, which is a startup company, which I'm sure lots of folks would have heard of. Um, now it's called Hive. It was bought by British Gas and we branded and became quite a big going concern. And that was thinking about remotely controlling your boiler at the time as well as other sensors and devices. And we used to talk a lot about customer experiences and what would you want to happen if this happened? What else should happen in your home? So for example, you know, if a sensor detected movement, start the camera and also send my phone a text. There were lots of those kinds of experiences. And I think we start to think about tariffs and the different home technologies that exist. I find it very reminiscent of that because you're trying to say things like, if I've got a heat pump, I would like my home to be comfortable when I'm at home, but I also am happy to use energy when it's cheaper. Equally, I have a, an EV and I want to charge my EV at the time at which I'm asleep, but I don't necessarily want to have to worry about programming both those things to happen myself. I want someone else to worry about that. And I can, you know, can see how these tariffs and experiences are going to evolve to make sense when you have these sort of very high-tech homes of the future, basically, because it will be easy for the customer to set and forget. And whilst us early adopters love to tinker, back to Scrap Heap Challenge, we love to mess about with, I want to turn this on and turn that off and I want to time it. But actually, most folk don't want that. Most want set and forget to make it cheaper for them. And they're happy to help the grid and, and the whole thing can kind of work as an ecosystem. So yeah, so SEG is a really good place to start when you start thinking about what about energy going in the other direction back to the grid as a customer. You're obviously very passionate about decarbonizing um, the grid. So where, in your opinion, is the biggest bang for the buck there? Is it decarbonizing transport, agriculture, heating, industry? What's your personal thoughts on that? Yes to all. I like to take a, a data-driven approach uh, generally. And so I think actually it's it's not a personal opinion. It's it's a it's a matter of fact that you know all of those that you've mentioned have a significant impact. Domestic heating is an even even bigger chunk of decarbonisation than transport. But I think if you break it down into transport specifically, you know thinking about modes of travel, thinking about you know shared mobility, better public transport. Um, you know, nicer environments where the car isn't the king for me is is going to be really interesting and really important. And some people again might think, well, hang on, Claire, you're a massive car fanatic. Anyone that knows me knows how much I love cars and I absolutely love EVs and I love getting into EVs and just giving them a go and chatting about them and trying them and that kind of thing. But actually, when you take a big step back to your question about decarbonisation, just replacing every ICE vehicle with an EV is not the way we're going to save the world thinking about different ways of living, different modes of living, different, you know, urban environments where vehicles can be different and your access to vehicles can be different means that we don't need to go down that route. And I think, you know, I think we need a bit of a cultural shift in thinking about how we move ourselves around the world. Now, obviously in rural areas, it isn't so easy and there are always going to be those use cases for personal mobility. Of course there are. But I think we should challenge ourselves to think, do I need to make this journey in the town in a vehicle on my own? And therefore, do I actually need this vehicle? Uh, you know, and I think about terrace streets, cars parked down both sides of the street, barely move. People don't necessarily, you know, really want to move if they don't have to because they'll lose their spot. I think those are quite interesting examples of where maybe we can start thinking about other ways of doing it. And you know, lots of lots of local authorities are really thinking about a lot about this. You know, people at like Oxford, for example, thinking about how do you how do you change the way you, people move around. So, so yeah. So, in terms of that kind of big decarbonisation challenge, I like to think about it in that transport lens and thinking like how can we do things differently. But it's going to take a system change, right? It's not individuals. It's not just you and me. It's important that we make personal, you know, impactful personal choices if we can, if that if our circumstances allow. But we need some system change as well, right? because we need to start radically rethinking how how we do this in towns and cities in particular. Yeah, absolutely. If I sort of pick up on one of the suggestions that I made there, which is uh, heating. Now, obviously, home heating is it's a large chunk of the amount of money that people spend on energy. And uh, I 
sort of this time last year. Well, I know it was exactly this time last year, but I had a heat pump installed. Cost me a reasonable chunk of money. And obviously since then, Octopus have decided to go into the the heat pump market and see whether they can democratize that and, and bring the price down. Do you do you want to talk a little bit about about that, what the aims are and, and how it's going? Yeah. So uh, decarbonization of heat in in the domestic setting is is very important. At the moment, most people burn fossil fuels in their home every day for heating and for water. And I I think that it's not something that people really think about. And I think even reasonably green people who think, well, I recycle and I think about, you know, choices when I'm shopping and I'm out of the out in the world, they're not necessarily thinking about their boiler because it is such a ubiquitous part of our lives, our kitchens, our homes, right? The way we do things. So it is a big challenge. Um, Octopus has been thinking about heat pumps for a long time, actually, you know, invested in uh, an R&D centre, building an R&D centre where there are two full-size houses, one built to 1970s building regs and one to 1990s, where testing and R&D and design is happening, uh, as well as training to understand, like, how do you work in these homes, right, which is a lot of the British housing stock um, of those types of houses, and how do we train up enough people to be able to fit heat pumps? Because you've had a heat pump fitted, right? So you know that the team that came were multi-skilled. They had to be gas uh, registered and capable to to turn off your gas in the first place. They had to be kind of into plumbing because they might have had to move your radiators around and and upgrade your emitters, so bigger emitters, bigger radiators. Probably a bit of you know DIY stroke, you know, general skills to punch holes in walls and you know fit the tanks that you need and all that kind of stuff. So so Octopus is investing in upskilling and training as well as R and D to make heat pumps. Um, smaller, more efficient, and therefore cheaper. Working with a company, uh, Red, in Northern Ireland, around manufacturing cheaper, smaller heat pumps. So yeah, so there's a lot going on in heat pumps as beyond thinking about like the tariff and the flexibility, and actually thinking about how do you make it cheaper for customers. And the other, I guess, the other challenge is around you know where is the space for a heat pump? A lot of folks will have taken out their old boilers and old tanks and turn that into a cupboard maybe, or you know they've lost that space in the home and put a combi boiler in. So there are lots of these challenges that Octopus are working on um, in the background. And then I guess there's that final piece is, so you've lived through having a heat pump fitted. I've, I've also got a heat pump, very lucky to have a heat pump fitted, it, but it's a huge disruption. So thinking about how do you smooth the customer journey? How do you do as much as you can to make it easy for customers? Yeah, it's all part of what Octopus is working on. Put your time travel hat on and take us forward 10 years. Now, what technology has come from nowhere and made the largest difference to decarbonisation? Now, bear in mind, you know, we go back to 2007, the iPhone hadn't, oh, well, 2006, the iPhone didn't exist. And then it came in, it changed the world. What do you think is the equivalent in green tech? Is it solid state batteries? Is it better heat pumps? Is it autonomous cars, electric planes? Or will the world finally go vegan and kill the whole cattle agriculture economy? What do you think? That's a good one. I talked about it a lot today, but I think flexibility and individuals understanding about how they can control the energy they use, when they use it, how they use it, is going to have an enormous impact, not just sort of immediately on that one household, but it will have a huge impact across our grid um, in the UK specifically. And I think other markets are starting to think about that. So I think it's maybe not a specific technology, but actually how, like, as societies, we use energy and we we think about it and we respect it a lot more. I think we've we've become far too reliant on, you know, you turn the light switch on and it happens and it's there. And the National Grid is an incredible organisation. Our grid in the UK is absolutely fantastic. And we're so lucky to have this amazingly res- resilient and reliable grid. But yeah, I think I think it will be a cultural shift to really thinking much more about how we use energy ourselves and how and what flexibility really means that we don't have to necessarily change our way of life that much to have a big impact on decarbonizing the grid as we move towards renewables. So I think it's it's more of a culture change and more of a, you know, a bit like, um, you know, you mentioned the iPhone, a bit like, you know, now we, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of us rely on apps uh, to to you know 
control everything we do and plan everything we do and make it really easy to access things, but also social media to talk to each other. And we've become more connected than we ever have been before. I think it's an extension of that rather than a specific technology. I mean, yes to all to batteries. So I'd love to give a shout out to Faraday Battery Challenge and, and all of the different you know, different technologies that are coming through from funding and, and support that's been going on for probably five or six years now. There's some really cool stuff coming. So Lena, looking at um, sodium iron, ionetic, looking at like novel battery pack designs. Oh, who else can I can I talk about? Yeah, there's like, there's so much to come in batteries. And so again, thinking about second life batteries and recycling of batteries, that is so, such an important part of the piece that we don't have yet. We have NMC technology today, moving to LFP, so different chemistries where you don't have so many sort of rare earth and, and, you know, critical minerals, thinking about then sodium iron. So maybe we don't need to have batteries that are so um, energy dense because actually most of our journeys are quite short. So sodium iron could be perfect for that. And then, as you say, solid state, what will that bring us? What what efficiencies will that gain us? Will it be too expensive, actually? And we'll all, we, we won't, we won't want to go that far. So that's an interesting um, area of technology to, to, to follow and keep an eye on. So, yeah, and I'm also quite interested around as larger vehicles electrify, what will that start to do for the grid? What will that start to do for for freight, um, for, for the cost of moving goods around, you know, what what impact will the technology choice now have on the cost of freight in the future? That's a whole area that is very, very early in terms of which technologies, you know, it's hydrogen going to play a part in that will biofuels play a part in that will it go full electric and they're big batteries on wheels right so then there's another interesting angle there around the total cost of ownership of a of a a freight lorry in the future will involve energy as part of that so yeah there's lots of different tech areas we can sort of delve into but i think broadly thinking about energy as part of our day-to-day lives is what's going to make the biggest impact because it will be in the minds of you know different businesses different folks from those who are not involved in the industry directly because it will be coming into our homes all the way through to the most sort of senior and influential leaders in in tech and, and in politics. It, thinking about how we use energy will become sort of forefront in people's minds. And I think that can only be a good thing when we think about how we decarbonize. Tell me one thing about renewable tech or decarbonization that most people either don't know or completely misunderstand. Something that would make the listeners go, Oh, I never knew that. Hopefully talking about this energy market concept has made them say, oh, okay, that's interesting. I definitely get that reaction a lot when we talk about, when I go out and talk to folks about, you know, the the market for energy that sits behind you turning a light on and off. And energy, let me think, oh, that is a really tough one. Maybe I'm too deeply in it and I haven't got any, con- I don't have enough like distance to, uh, to, to be able to judge like what, what would get people's eyebrows raising. Yeah, I think, I think vehicle to grid as well. Again, I'm really in a bubble, I think, of early adopters. And when I talk to friends and, and family about, by the way, very soon you'll be able to take that en- electricity out of the car battery that you just put in. And they're going, hang on, I haven't even got an electric car yet. And I haven't even worked out which charger I need to get. And I haven't even worked out what tariff. And now you're telling me I can take the energy out of the battery. Why would I do that? How did it work? So I think I think still vehicle to grid actually gets people really excited, sometimes confused, sometimes a bit nervous. So um, so yeah, I'm going to probably, probably bring it back to my old pal vehicle to grid. <laughs> That's fair enough. Uh, so final question. What didn't I ask you today that you would have liked me to have asked you? Maybe a bit of a left field one here, but as a woman and an engineer and someone who's like deeply into this space, still aghast, I guess, if that's not too, you know, too much of a overstatement at how few women are coming into the industry and how few women still visible uh, in senior leadership roles. And I think, you know, we, we do have some excellent examples, but, you know, shining lights is not the same as having a really diverse community. So I guess the thing I would like to be asked is what would my message be to folks out there who are involved in recruiting and hiring and training and coaching? And it's do everything you can to make sure that you don't look around and see lots of people who look like you looking back and that's not just physical that's people who've been to the same school or the same university or had the same upbringing or come from the same 
country. You know, we need a true diversity in our workplaces because we're tackling the biggest problems. So I think that's probably the thing I, I would like to be asked is, you know, what would I say to those folks out there who have some influence and also, you know, platforms like this and at conferences and events, there are people out there. Sometimes you have to work to find them. Sometimes they're quite junior because this is a really nascent industry. And sometimes the people that you need to find that are really working on this stuff aren't C-level. You know, they aren't super senior and they don't have swanky titles, but they're the really folks that you need to get to. So, And I, and I'm, I love helping to find those people and make introductions and make suggestions. So if there are people listening to this thinking, that's all well and good, but how do I go about that? Then my uh, my messages are always open. People can always message me and I would be delighted to help. That, I think, is a perfect opportunity to uh, bring this to a close. Claire Millet, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. A couple of takeaways from that discussion. It's clear that Claire and others working in the renewable sector are sure that there is no single route to decarbonisation. Claire mentioned several things that play into this, such as time of day tariffs, heat pumps, demand management, vehicle to grid, electric vehicles. And these all work together to both reduce electricity demand overall and manage or move demand during the day to ensure peaks and troughs are levelled out. Secondly, the discussion on vehicle to grid and its implementation was interesting. The two options are either a customer needs a specific charger on their house which performs the activity of the inverter swapping DC to AC and back, or the inverter goes into the car and the customer's charger is just like a standard home charger is at the moment. The problem arises when half the OEMs decide to do one and half decide to do another. And that could lead to a situ- situation in future where I buy a car with an onboard inverter allowing me to keep my existing charger. But when I replace that car, I buy one that doesn't have the onboard inverter. So I then need to upgrade my charger as well to allow vehicle to grid. This means we'll end up with, as Claire said, a bifurcation, where some of the population can only buy cars with onboard inverters for vehicle to grid, and the rest can only buy cars without onboard converters. And that's an education aspect that I think we could really do without. My thanks to Claire for a great discussion. Uh, She'll be back later in the season with an interesting take on what she's personally doing to decarbonise her family. I'm pretty sure nobody else will have offered the same suggestion on the podcast before. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. As you know, we're big fans of electric aircraft on this show, so any chance to highlight a movement in this area is always welcome. Swiss-based aircraft manufacturer Jekta Switzerland SA is developing an electric passenger hydro aircraft or seaplane capable of flying nearly 100 miles on a single charge. Jekta revealed the electric seaplane, the PHA-ZE100, at the Abu Dhabi Air Expo last year. The amphibious aircraft will generate zero emissions. It has 10 motors and an electric propulsion system supplying 180 kilowatts of power. It will be able to fly for two hours with an extra two hours reserved at cruising speeds up to 135 knots, up to 19 passengers and three crew members. The first order is for 10 planes from Dubai-based Gaio Aviation and Tourism, which looks to reduce emissions. Although seaplanes make up a small percentage of civil aviation, they can be especially dangerous in terms of greenhouse gas emissions due to their short and frequent stops. So it's great to see more movement in this area. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps EV drivers search, plan and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. 
is available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at MusingCV with the words, more scrap heap challenge than lab coats. Hashtag, if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, his life would be immeasurably easier if they would invent a battery the size of a AAA that held the charge of one in a Tesla Model 3. It would be so much easier to make, use, and recycle. But I told him that's not happening because my top battery electric chemist tells me it's against the laws of physics. He told me, I would never presume to disagree with Ewan McTurk, Dr. Ewan McTurk. Thanks for listening. Bye.